So I'll, I'll present what uh, we did in Thales in the railway domain with TLA plus and how we solved some problems there. So uh, I'm working for the task control platform. So we decided well, way, way back, uh, almost, well, I think 20 years back, the decision was made that uh, all the railway applications, they have the same requirements concerning safe computation, safe communication. And the idea was, okay, we produce one platform that does safe computation, safe communication, and reuse that throughout all applications. And so this is how Task Control Platform was born. Uh, it's certified according to the CENEX standards there, highest uh, safety integrity level, so SIL4, so for interlockings and things where it matters. And our safety concept uh, builds up on a safety layer, which we build in software on top of COTS hardware, COTS operating systems. So we say in software, we've got a fault tolerance layer there that does the voting, that does message exchange, etc. And we've got health monitoring for the individual boards. And we provide various redundancy architectures, so two out of two, two out of three. Uh, we also have board support packages so that uh, railway-specific uh, drivers, etc., can be interfaced there. And the idea is that uh, developing a safety-critical application is expensive, and you want to be sure that it works. And you do not want to change the business logic a lot if the underlying hardware changes. So chips and hardware boards, uh, I mean, your, your mobile phone that you bought yesterday is obsolete tomorrow, and so you can take a new one. But here, of course, we want to support the business logic and say, if we have new hardware, then we can reuse that. And it's widely adopted within the Thales ground transportation. So, <clears throat> so what we now had to do for the new version is uh, we've got the new redundancy architecture. And this is, it's a bit different than the other ones. And so we thought, OK, we should make sure that the algorithms in there, they're sound, they, they work, they're correct. So the idea was to use formal methods there and check whether they are good. And this was mainly to gain confidence in the design, to really ensure that all these corner cases, oh, some node sends a message and some other node sends another message. And what happens then, what you can never think of in your head as a human, to really use that here. And of course, it had to be feasible in time and effort. So of course, going along and then trying to uh, get insight on the design and so on. If that takes too long, then we wouldn't make it to a product. Of course, we've got the timeline, we've got applications that have to be in field quite soon. And what we also wanted to have is a close representation of the model to the implementation. Because, of course, there are also bugs introduced if you read some specification. Even if it's a, if it's a formal specification, you might introduce small bugs, because not all the details might be captured by the model. And also, what we wanted to have it close to the uh, implementation is that our engineers, they used to write state machines in C for a really long time. So if this is close to a state machine in C, they can also relate to this code and also give us feedback there. So it took us a while to evaluate what's on the market, etc. And uh, I remembered at some point a talk by Leslie Lamport he gave in 2010 at IST. And uh, then the word TLA popped up in my head and I searched for it. And luckily the Amazon paper gave a little bit of advertisement. And so we gave it a try. So, and after several other evaluations, what we came up with was uh, a formal model in TLA plus and Plasco. Yeah. Uh, we thought of UPAL, so because that's of course is timed automatons. Uh, someone mentioned SAL, and uh, I looked at the SAL web page of SRI, and it didn't look really active. And yesterday I asked someone at the formal methods conference from SRI whether it's active, and he said no. They cancelled it in two thousand eight. <laughs> we looked at. Uh, uh, B and event B, but this was more into proofs, so it wouldn't give fast feedback. Of course, 
we're using it in the company for other things, for data validation. And Are you wonder looking at that a little bit? Uh, we, we looked at this probe B as well, but only very short. Okay. So, And uh, it, it's not that close to the implementation. But yeah, it was just to see, uh, oh, OK, someone used this TLA plus. And then we figured, OK, we, we might go along with that. And of course, Upal also has its success stories. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> yeah. So is, is that sat satisfying? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, we found that we uh, need a really good level of abstraction for model checking. So we've got different modules at different levels of abstraction that we do check. And each one building up from the other in some sort. And we came up with a, a method of doing uh, design, which we call property driven design, uh, to systematically, basically this step where it says, you, now you've got your model and then fiddle around to f figure out whether your model does what it should do. Well, this gives it a li little bit more formal context there. And to uh, some surprise, or actually, it, it was not initial the idea to c generate C code, but we figured, oh, we can do that. And so this really closes the gap between the model and the implementation. So we can really generate the cores, uh, state machines from the model there. So just how our model in general looks like. So we've got the algorithm, so the state machine defined in Pluscal, which is in blue here. Uh, similar to the approach presented this morning, uh, we have some uh, environment that sets up message exchange, etc. Uh, we manipulate the program counter for that. So we just say, okay, now with the program counter, some node can now do something and so on. Uh, we've got three different classes of events. So we say progress events. So these are node local events like uh, receive a message or a timeout expires or something like that. We've got fault events in there, so what can go wrong? And then something we call upper layer events, uh, which is basically from the layer above requests that the layer can set there. And our properties that we check there, there, for example, here we've got no two masters for master election uh, property. And liveness, all nodes eventually get the correct view of the system, which of course is a really nice way there to formulate something quite strong. And the TLC model checker is what we use there to really be fast in reality. So yes, we've, we've got the model checker. And the model checker says yes. And, and, and what do you do? <laughs> I mean, if the model checker says no, it's, 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 it's nice. You've got a trace and say, I mean, you might have a trace that looks a little bit long, <laughs> a little bit awkward. But if the model checker says yes, uh, it's, it's quite hard. Can you, say, can you say you said it was a, a, a real-time system? Yes. So did you, use a, did you write a real-time specification? So what we did with real-time was, of course, there's this paper from, uh, of Leslie input. I, I can just increment which gives you an infinite sequence. <laughs> so the infinite state space, we didn't want to have that. What we did is we, uh, we, can, we, we know of the underlying system, some properties of the timeouts and of the message exchange delays. So we can say, uh, if I start a timeout with respect to message exchange, I can send to another node a message and get an answer back before that timeout expires. And with that granularity, we were able to abstract away this infinite state space to say, OK, we can just have it small and nice. Because you, but usually, usually in real-time systems, there are no li everything is safety, right? The life property is safety. So you, yeah, you well, liveness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Li liveness is what's really crucial here is liveness as well. So, so really having the availability. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to get a new architecture if that wouldn't also have the availability that we needed there. I think what I was asking is if you were interested in a time bound for, for oh, the well, until the 
no, no, in the in the in the time bound there. We we had uh, we we've got other mechanisms to check that they eventually reach a decision there. It's it just do they eventually reach a decision? Is that when do they reach the decision? We've got other mechanisms also than high level timeout supervision, etc. And up up to the hardware watchdog. But this is so in the model itself, we do not claim that within a certain number of timeouts something happens. So you replace time constraints with fairness. Oh yes. We've got we've got fairness there, yeah. and and the other thing that had an infinite state space were sequence numbers, but we just arranged them in a ring. So, yeah. Are there other questions to the to this slide? No. Okay. So what what we then came up with? Uh, model checker says yes. Is a way to be sure how this model check checker came to the result and be sure of your model. So uh, what, what's quite known in industry is, of course, test-driven development. And the idea is here with the property-driven development just to observe many traces of the model. And you check that what it does in <coughs> indeed captures what you wanted to do. What does this, why does this property hold to really see why uh, why in the model it this property holds, etc. And what you also do with this is you can monitor the state space as you develop the model. So this is also really helpful. But back to test-driven development. I mean, te test-driven development is everyone familiar? Or just write a test, let it fail, ext extend it, execute all tests, they pass, refactor, maybe execute all tests again. So similar here, define a new property. Where does this property come from? Well, from low level requirements. It comes from feedback of the model. So you found out the model has some certain, uh, or your, your, your model has some certain properties that you want to capture while designing. Find, oh yeah, I, I shouldn't add a new property there. And <clears throat> then you run the model checker. And maybe it even fails. Just like that. So the next step is to enhance the environment. So if there's something in the environment that you need to be able to do here, you can adapt that and run the model checker and see if it fails. And then if it fails, you can adapt the state machine and you can iterate over that. And the difference to test-driven uh, development here is that you have one property and that usually covers quite a large space of the state machine already. And here you, you always uh, look at the traces when it fails and see wh why did this fail? Is, is, is this actually the reason that I wanted this property to fail because of what I see in the trace? To really make sure, oh, no, this, this f trivially fails because some other parts of the specification I didn't think of. Yeah, and then the idea is to negate the property and just check that this really gives you what you wanted to have. So really this shows an example of, yeah, this property doesn't hold because something is there. So maybe you have to add another trace there, another property to check whether this really happened here. And then you can go on to the next property. So when, when you're finished with that, well, all the requirements that you know you can specify in the system are covered. And of course, intuition, as always. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you found significant bugs by uh, doing the negation? Yes, we. I, I have this on a later slide, but yes, we found uh, we found scenarios that we didn't anticipate originally. So, usually, usually you design such an algorithm by getting a few experienced engineers together go to whiteboard and say, okay, this is now how we do it. <laughs> and uh, we found scenarios that we didn't think of initially with these mechanisms there. And there were traces of more than 30 steps. So it wasn't 100 and more, so 30 steps. But uh, yeah, it, it, it definitely gave us the feedback there. And, and finding these things during uh, testing, that's 
less expensive. So that's so. Yeah, and when you track the state space between these individual model tracker runs, you really get the feedback of and first did the state space increase when I added functionality. This is quite good to know that it's not something that you added that just doesn't isn't uh, executed or evaluated there. And if you've got a sudden increase in size, of course, it's not like if you go from n of four to five, well, there you might have a sudden increase in size. But if you have a sudden increase in size on the smaller modules or smaller state spaces, then most likely there's something wrong with what you just specified. Because you, you, you just get a feeling there of how, how much did it grow from the last step to the next and so on. If it suddenly takes, first it took a minute and suddenly it takes an hour, or it doesn't even, or you don't even wait for an hour to uh, abort it, then you've, you've, you know, oh, maybe I did something there that wasn't quite what I intended to. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, we, we, we want availability. Okay. <laughs> we really want availability there. <laughs> so, and, and, and how do these properties now drive this process? So, so the invariants, yes, help detect bugs. So mm -hmm. I put that here also not. So maybe I should use David's definition, like issues, because <laughs> we, we don't have that shipped yet. Uh, so if, if you define these invariants, of course, they help you to see, oh, OK, now this didn't work as well. But only the liveness properties really drive you. So if you, if you have this invariant where you say, oh, there, there are not, no two masters are allowed. But if you don't have the property that says, eventually, some node is a master, then you're not going to get there. And this, this really helps with liveness and really helps with availability. And it really gives you examples where you see, oh, I might have something like a life lock there, or some situation like that. So what to sum it up, this property-driven development. So we've got instant feedback. So you, you see these traces, and you know what's going on in your design. And you can then make maybe more profound decisions in what you do next. Yet many traces really make you feel comfortable that what you did is what you wanted it to do. Because just having this, our oh, model checker says yes, is <laughs> a bit, bit tricky. Yeah, here's we found uh, scenarios we didn't think of initially, and yeah, the the major drawback, of course, is the time it takes this process to really re-execute all the model checking, etc. But we feel it's worth it. Yeah. So now this plus call to C transformation, just to show that it's quite simple. So here, here on one side, we've got procedure. And here we've got void. <laughs> it's really easy, really simple transformation. So nothing really complex going on there. Maybe if you have an assignment of record to a variable. But other than that, just remove the self. And the rest is pretty much the same, I mean the comments. Yeah, yeah, you, you start the ti timeout. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Start the timeout, timeout ping. With, with what, what time? Timeout ping, startup time. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've open sourced a small example there with almost a complete environment. <laughs> so, and, and if you now go a step further and say, okay, I did this for one module and I have to do it for a few modules. Then you need, of course, for each of these modules, a specific environment that also captures the behavior of the outer models. Of course, that's, that can be a bit more complicated. Uh, but you can do that to avoid state space explosion. So maybe also that had an in influence in our design. But it was a good idea to capture different parts of the algorithm in different modules. And yes, this new environment always that's quite an effort. Uh, yeah, you should be really cautious about your interfaces there, of course. And if you can simply layer it, then this is the nicest approach. If you have something that's not directly layered, 
gets a bit more tricky. So now, now is a short wish list, <laughs> potentially improvement. Readable traces, I think we heard that one today already. <laughs> uh, here's some uh, thing that used diff and some VI syntax highlighting, uh, but it's also not when you say readable traces, do you mean use the ones in the toolbox or just the text ones? Well, wh whichever way. I mean, if the toolbox provides traces where I can really see large traces, where I can really see, oh, these are the essential parts, etc. Yeah, but did you have a problem with the traces in the toolbox? Well, you, you, it, they are also quite large there because you, you, you then expand, 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 and what what we found was really helpful to see all the variables at all the time because if you see what's what's the transition what what do the other variables have as a value and then just also see the delta there but i think the toolbox does highlighting in bold there there is support for highlighting this yes. you see a different coloring for whether a variable has changed and something has been added to a cell or removed so there is coloring and there's also a shortcut that expands and collects complete traces okay yeah yeah but still it's uh I mean, we had this just little part here, but still it's uh, not too easy to go through the old, all the traces. I'm using the um, space trace or error trace exploration where you can come up with your own. Oh, yeah, yeah, where, where, where you just put a few formulas, evaluate them over yeah. all of them, and then still have to go back to oh, what, what, what did the rest actually say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it works quite well, but Still readable traces, is, I, I don't have a solution to that. So maybe there are some graphics people that can <laughs> think of something. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a visualization problem. Yeah, visualization is there very much. Because it, it's like when you have logs and you grab through something, okay, that, that might help and reduce it. But, but here, actually, you want to have parts and then you want to have of course all the information again so I, I i i have no solution there but this yeah and animation that that would be great like really starting up and say okay and what's the next step that you can take oh take some step here etc of course pro b is there one tool that can do it and so on and yeah of course faster check of knifeness properties but <laughs> i guess this is this is wishful thinking there. What was your, when you say faster, what was your turnaround? Were you making some change and then wanting to rerun stuff? Uh, well, when the, the current version of, let's say, the largest module checks now in four hours. And liveness check takes, I think, two hours of that. I'm not too sure about this. But of course, we want liveness check. No, no, we, we try to be really, really <laughs> small with the state space here. Okay. It's really optimized for the state space. Uh, so we, we get 300, oh, in, in, in C we count semicolons, 300 lines of C code out of that. Oh. But the environment, of course, is way larger. Right. Also, what hardware, I mean, is that? Oh, that's a 40 core Intel something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's four, you, 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 four is 10 sports, right? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. liveness is, yeah, these two hours could be, <laughs> but you know, yeah, and, uh, yeah and, and you start it up with uh, how much memory I was, 96 gigabyte, and so off you go. What do you want to, to check uh, some kind of liveness property? Can you give me an example? You want to prove some termination, I don't know, something like that? Or? Yeah, well, for example, that all nodes eventually see the same master, for example. Ah, okay. Things like that. It's quite simple things, but, uh, but essential. Why, why <laughs> and, and of course, the, the, this is like all nodes see the same master, but in case of a fault, mm -hmm. and then things get bigger, <laughs> of course. So what, what, what did we learn on, on this uh, exercise, let's say like that? So we got really valuable insight into our system design really good feedback there. It was justifiable overhead, although we took some time to set all these things up, learn TLA plus, 
uh, and it's very close to the implementation. So people, so experienced engineers, they look at the code and they say like, yeah, that's not different. Why, 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 why should we make a fuss about that now? No, no it's, it's fine. Of course, if they look at the environment, they say, okay, hopefully we don't have to debug that, but <laughs> that's a different. <laughs> so, and we open sourced an example there. So this is, this is the time in there. <laughs> yeah. Ping pong. Ping pong. Yeah, it's, it's not the business code. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.